like to introduce you to uh, Dr. David Green, who is uh, who is the founder of uh, R3 Stem Cells, and we will be talking to you about uh, that in detail. And uh, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Mohsin Nawi. Uh, he is the MD of R3 Stem Cell here, and uh, Dr. Green, who basically will be answering your questions. And uh, Dr. Mohsin will uh, enlighten you more about uh, the R3 stem cell therapy. So, first of all, I would like to start uh, with the lovers, and for that, I would like to call on this one. Uh, I would like to recite 99 names of the Lord Almighty that can bring countless blessings for all of those who hear them and recite them. nephrologist, medical specialist, <coughs> transplant physician, professor of nephrology, U.S. Lahore, uh, chairman and federal administrator, Human Organ Transplant Authority. It is our honor that he is here with us to discuss uh, some important things about our stem cells. Uh, I would like to call him. I went to all the healthy clinics, Dr. Jared Green, my healthy clinics from other hospitals. Uh, uh, we will be talking very briefly about uh, the origin of the stem cells and the original introduction to our junior clinics. And we have the second slide, please. Uh, what I was working in most of the hospitals of uh, Pakistan and Pakistan uh, and Pakistan and Pakistan. For a great dream come true, the first thing is the capacity to dream, and the second is perseverance. So we accommodated the idea of floating the stem cell in this country, where the conventional therapies are not available in our patients. 
can be called the business. One more thing. These are the cells uh, which are very strong cells and uh, they are like commando cells and they have the body to heal itself. So they are right from the same human body and they will heal the same thing without any having side effects. Yes. <coughs> So before that, we will uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, briefly uh, tell you about what these stem cells are, what are the types of sources, uh, stages of development, and stem cell therapy in the conditions uh, like blood conditions, endocrine, autosis, uh, CMS conditions, muscular skeletal conditions, chronic kidney disease, uh, arthritis, some of the disease from Adazo. So you will be right about that as well. Next. Um, yes. Today, living in the 21st century, we still don't have the proper treatment of many many conditions, which are very progressive, very landmark diseases like the Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. You will have it, you because the diabetes is killing you from uh, here to toe. Um, so, some kind of hope for the treatment of these incurable diseases is by stem cell. Uh, a lot of research is advancing on the stem cell therapy. This promising area of science investigates the possibility of cell based therapy. So, the cellular therapy, we have with us Dr. Aftar, who is a biological scientist, who uh, is a PhD in biological sciences. So, he is the member of our team as well. So, basically, <coughs> there is some cell based therapy, uh, and uh, this is referred to as regenerative medicine. Next, please. The stem cells are undifferentiated biological cells that can differentiate into specialized cells and can divide into mitosis. Uh, and they have the ability to self uh, generate and the ability to differentiate into different cells. So these are very dynamic sort of cells where they can do a lot of regeneration, as uh, Professor David Green always says, the regeneration and then the repair and then uh, restoration. So these are the three main pillars of the early stem cell therapy where we are providing regeneration and repair and then restoration of the function. <coughs> so these are the cells which can have the ability, which are for the ability that they can self regenerate and generate and then they can differentiate into well differentiated tissues like musculoskeletal tissues, like nervous tissues, like mesenchymal cells in the universe. Uh, two cells, two tripotent cells, one tripotent cells. So these are the various types of the cells uh, because the human body, once uh, God makes uh, the uh, embryo, then these cells they come into being, and the two tripotent cells uh, they are able to differentiate almost all cell types. The two tripotent cells they differentiate into any other type of cells. For example, zygote for egg fertilization. So first we have two potent cells, then we have three potent cells, then there are multi potent cells which have ability, which have got ability to differentiate into closely related family of cells like hemopathic stem cells, and there are um, then only potent cells which uh, which take only a few cell lines um, like the lymphatic tissue or the myelite cells. So they are designated to make a specific tissue. And then we have got the important cells. And the derivatives of the stem cells, we have got exosomes, uh, which are the extra uh, similar part we can also give as a stem cell therapy. Next. Um, so these are the, I think that the most of the people they can focus on it. Uh, but uh, uh, what I explained is the part of that. You know, this uh, is the embryo, and you can see that uh, the implantation site, and over there in this small circle, we have got these uh, pluripotent cells, and then they differentiate into different uh, types like angular, actoderm, mesoderm, and then we take it from the next piece. <coughs> what are the sources of the stem cells? So we can take it from the bird tissues. We can take it from uh, the adult uh, tissues and we can take it from the cadavers. So uh, we can take it from the red tissues, we can take it from the left out embryos, we can take it from the uh, uh, clone embryos, the parted embryos, but these are 
I mean uh, for experimental purposes. For the therapeutic purposes, we take it from the blood tissues like the umbilical cord, placenta, amniotic membranes, and amniotic fluid. So these are the blood tissues where we take them in birth and then in the harvest. The second thing is that uh, we can take them from adult tissues and adult organs like bone marrow. We can give certain uh, uh, medicines to stimulate the bone marrow so they can grow away. But with the period of time with aging, we can, we are our own uh, hemophytic stem cells, their number goes very down and down and down. So these cells are of very little use because they are very scanty in top number. Similarly, below the skin and in the mesenchymal and in the adipose tissue, which is another source of the stem cell, there the cells are very, very scanty. We can't collect them in a big quantity. And second, they are not that strong enough um, so that we can uh, make the therapeutic use of them in an early setting. Next, please. So then there are certain stages of development and you can see that the blastocyst uh, is uh, the first stage and from there uh, we see this, uh, the rest of uh, the multiplication which is going on. Next, please. Here yeah, again we can see that there are embryonic cells, then there is our blastocyst which is where there is a cavity. And in this blastocyst we have got inner cell mass. Now this inner cell mass is the potent source of the embryonic stem cells. And from there, you know, there is a, a further differentiation of the cells which is going on. Uh, ectoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And then these three lines are making your whole body. The ectoderm is making CMS cells. Mesoderm is making your blood vessels. And uh, the endoderm is making your blood that makes this so, axis hormones, <laughs> these are the byproducts, products of the, uh, the cells. This is something which is an option of the stem cells. And this result involved using the donor cells in body. Instead, these are extracted from related human mesenchymal uh, cells. Here you can see uh, these little tiny vessels which are located outside the cell. And they have got very extraordinary features like their antiphonomy anti-fibrotic and they are easy to uh, administer in always Dr. Dewey Peel says that we always give them in billions and billions and billions um, and these are very tiny kind of structures and very tiny creatures that we, we, we collect them in heart has that so that goes hand in hand with the stem cell therapy so that is an actual therapy to the stem cell therapy then we give almost 50% of the stem cells and we give 50% of the exosome to have anti inflammatory anti-fibrotic effect and effect on many cytokines and endocrines to control the pathophysiology of a degenerative condition. Um, okay, so uh, this is a site based and this is a direct delivery as well. We can take uh, we can use of the advantage as well, but they are very scanty, therefore we uh, go to the umbilical tissue. Placenta, which in Pakistan goes in waste, the umbilical cord goes in waste, the bird, the embryo, the amniotic fluid, all goes in waste. So we can make use of them, but unfortunately, that's very, very expensive. And therefore, we can't make the umbilical cord bank in Pakistan, and therefore, we are importing them directly from Mexico and USA in the health of the next week. How stem cell therapy works? Uh, well, they are transplanted into the body and they arrive in the injured place where they do not do a lot of regeneration, you know, and uh, the stem cells can be in contact with the growth factors and, uh, and they do a lot of interactions. These chemicals can program the stem cells to differentiate with the tissue surrounding them. So they can make a new cartilage, they can make a new cell line things like that and wherever there is a uh, capacity to repair and regenerate they can exactly go there um, and they can start their work for instance. Then some therapy is for uh, many metabolical <laughs> conditions we give these uh, adult uh, stem cells as a part of the bone marrow although they are extracted from the bone marrow and you know the bone marrow transplant. What is bone marrow transplant? This is the they were writing the stem cells uh, to the patients, you know. So this uh, idea of bone level transplant is basically to give the biting stem cells unutilized or unutilized or whatever. Here it is, next please. Um, okay, next please. So uh, there are many steps that uh, uh, we, uh, we collect them 
Uh, these cancers are collected and this is known as harvesting. Then the high dose we need to remove the remaining cancer cells and this step is called conditioning regime. And then these cells are they are required for a trip similar to our blood transfusion. So they are extracted, they are harvested, uh, they are looked after, they are conditioned, their growth factors, many things are added to them. And then there's a final shape. So it's a very tricky and a very um, scientific way of doing it. But the flower and we are doing autonomous, autonomous uh, stem cell transplantation in Mega last to last year. So that was a very tedious process to take from the animal tissue and then to do this, this and that. So it's a very tedious procedure. Um, okay. Diabetes is one of the conditions which is uh, with a global uh, prevalence and this needs to be controlled because the islands are they are getting aged. Because the islands are getting aged, so we need to restore their function and regenerate. And then for diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, complicated diabetes, diabetic kidney disease, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic retinopathy, these are all conditions where we can try stem cell therapy with confidence. So the confidence in the conventional therapy is going down in this case. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, similarly, there are other conditions like here for resistant to chronic intractable heart failure. We are just short of putting a new heart and putting a new uh, left ventricle or left ventricle access device. We have nothing on board. But now, this tension has made it possible that in the intractable to cardiomyopathies we can try stem cells in the conditions like hookum and other congestive cardiomyopathies, postpartum cardiomyopathies, very intractable chronic um, uh, congestive heart failures. We can try this therapy and particularly in Malaysia and in the Far East, you know, there are many studies which have been done and they have been published and um, that they, they work even on this condition. Yes, Kidney disorders. Now, this is our idea because you know, we see a lot of autoimmune conditions, we see a lot of uh, uh, pathophysiology of uh, the uh, immunological, very bad immunological disorders, which uh, uh, give rise to you know, the free radius and the free radius and the free radius, they all are within the kidneys in one and another way. They are primary and secondary as well. So, in the kidney is an area where if we can do a little bit of regeneration, we can start and Arrest the progression of the disease. I mean, this is a win win, -win situation. And next piece. Um, so, the pulmonary diseases, the major kidney diseases, the polycystic kidney disease, the diabetic kidney disease, cardiac syndrome, systemic vasculitis, diabetic foot disease, chronic allograph dysfunction. Even those patients who have got good graft function, people go for uh, uh, distension therapy to have a better uh, outcome. Uh, and better survival of their graft. And if there is a graft dysfunction of any type, immediate or uh, delayed graft dysfunction, then stem cell therapy is an adjuvant therapy which can work very well. Next please. Uh, so I think that I'm going to an end. Uh, now there are serious conditions and spinal cord conditions. I was working as a neurologist in St. Jesus Hospital two decades ago. So I, that was a very frustrating situation at that particular time because we had very few things available to go for the end-stage Parkinson's disease and end-stage uh, multiple sclerosis and end-stage uh, ALS and end-stage motor neuron disease, macular degeneration, things like that. But now the time has arrived that we can give intrathecal and uh, IV these therapies. Now the next, uh, uh, and the very last slide, please. Um, okay. So it's like the Parkinson's disease. You know, many people, they are Alzheimer's disease has got a family history, so families are drawn into it. The early, family, the early familial onset of the Alzheimer's disease is very, very frustrating. Once it is hitting in the fourth or fifth decades, it's very relentless situation. And very few therapies they are working against that. But now the stem cell therapy has arrived, so we can say now that there is some therapy available that can arrest the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And so, so then we have about this Parkinson's disease, which uh, leads to very total freezing of the body, and uh, it has got very high mortality because there are cardiomyopathies and brain failures with that. So we can do wonders by giving them periodic uh, stem cell therapy as well. Next, please. Um, so this is uh, the conclusion that this is a great promise for the regenerative medicine. 
There is enormous potential in the human stem cell research, both in America and in the stem cells. We need more researchers, we need the young guys to come over and help us out, and we will help them out as well in creating the new studies, the new over studies in various conditions where we can try and stem cell therapy medicines. Stem cell therapy and to benefits give hope to the hopeless and rewrite the medical science would so make life, <laughs> like I don't say immortal, but it can make life a bit more stable, like let's say. Next. Um, <coughs> okay, next. Thank you very much for patient listening. Dr. David Green is here, and we will take your question and answer sessions and uh, the will make a bit more pleasant. <laughs> Thank you very much, and over to Dr. Green. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out today. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about stem cell therapy or anything at all. Are there any side effects of this therapy? Sure, very good question. So when we give the therapies, uh, we do it as an outpatient uh, for the most part and either by way of an injection. So for instance, if somebody has arthritis of the knee, it's a direct injection into the joint um, for the soft tissue area. We also do IV therapy. So for diabetes, as an example, they've looked at studies where you do the uh, therapy um, into the pancreas tissue or into the vessels around the, the pancreas. Um, and the results are no better. They're really good, but they're no better than if you just do it IV. So we go with the safest approach, which is IV. Um, as in, another example would be, there was a, a study last, uh, two years ago at Stanford, where for stroke patients, they actually did drill holes in the skull and then injected the stem cells around the area of the stroke. We don't do that. We do it through intrafecal approach, which is very safe. And, um, and then for people who have lung disease, we'll do it through a nebulizer, which is really, really easy and safe. Um, and sometimes we'll do a, a, a must intramuscular procedure, which works well for some conditions. As far as side effects goes, um, most of the side effects that we've seen have been in the minor to moderate category. We've never had a, a, what you would call a significant adverse event, meaning no uh, deep infection. We've never had a rejection reaction. Uh, from the donor tissue, it just doesn't happen. Um, we've never had anything that would put somebody like into the hospital. No disease transmission either. When the tissue comes from the donor and goes to our lab in the United States, the FDA has very, very rigorous quality assurance standards we have to go by. The list of disease entities that get tested for is huge. We have to run it through uh, uh, to look for pathogens as well as bacteria, viruses. And when the tissue's done getting processed, it goes into a cryogenic freezer, and it's called the quarantine freezer. So it stays there for two weeks until all the tests come back. If any of the tests is positive, all the tissue gets discarded. So only if it's all negative can it then be sent out. For instance, I bring them on dry ice you know, over here. Um, and the, so the side effects that we have seen, uh, potentially some chills for a few hours, maybe a headache, maybe a uh, low-grade fever, um, not lightheadedness, dizziness, um, and I would say about 98% of all those resolve within 12 hours, the rest typically 24 hours. Um, we just haven't seen really anything, like I said, as significant. Uh, yes, how many randomized control trials have been conducted? What is the evidence for this? Sure. So, when you look at how many studies have been done on mesenchymal stem cell therapy, which is what we're offering, so umbilical cord stem cells have very, very active mesenchymal stem cells. So, over the last 20 years, 
there has been a lot of studies done on the mesenchymal stem cell therapy. A lot of it's been autologous, whether it's bone marrow or adipose. And over the last 10 years, tons of research on umbilical cord and mesenchymal stem cells. Now, I would say about half of it, well, maybe 70% of their research is not randomized, double blinded, pro spectral control. Okay? It's more of like cohort types of retrospective studies that are more like level four evidence. Okay? So you, know, you can take those for, for what they're worth. Um, but the randomized, double blinded, prospective, we have a lot of those now for various conditions. And it's been very exciting to see the outcomes. And what are the conditions you think are the most of uh, the stem cell therapies being successful? Great question. What's the uh, more than fifty percent successful? Sure. So um, in the U.S. is where we started ten years ago. Um, the most common condition that we see is degenerative osteoarthritis, and we've seen uh, upper eighty percent, so close to ninety percent effectiveness for patients because we asked them a year later. Would you have it done again? Would you recommend it to friends and family? So really just like a net promoter score. Kind of so if you were to this comparing with totally replacement in grade four muscle practice. Sure. So, so, how do you compare this? So with total knee replacement, we used to think that it was 90% effective. When I was in practice, you know, 20 years ago, it's not. The latest studies out of um, uh, British Medical Journal and clinical orthopedics show that about 35% of patients have considerable pain after one year, after the knee replacement, and oftentimes that never goes away. And obviously that's an irreversible you know, procedure. So when you have something like this, where whether it's uh, grade one up to grade four osteoarthritis, it works well for all those different grades for one to seven years, um, it's a great opportunity especially for people who are younger to avoid a new replacement. Even for older individuals who just, they have one, they don't really like it, they don't want to do the other one. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I, um, before COVID, I was traveling about 20 days a month in the U.S. doing seminars. All the time people come up afterwards and they say, how do I uh, undo a new replacement? I really don't like the one I have. Well, you know, obviously you can't. So osteoarthritis is, is works really, really, really well. The next category would be autoimmune diseases. We, I'd say it's about 80% effective for everything from RA to um, diabetes, falls into the autoimmune category. Um, uh, what do you call it? Lupus, um, psoriasis, and you name it in the autoimmune category. Because one of the ways that stem cells work really well is by immune modulation. So it's been very exciting to see those, those types of outcomes. And it's great, I mean, you, you'll see people who get maybe just one year of relief. But there was a nice study, double blind and everything on RA, which showed that about 40 million stem cells, these patients got three years on average of remission from that. Um, so auto of the Remission rate for all certifiers. Remission rate for all So we talk about PRP, you know, PRP is not a stem cell therapy. It really doesn't help the creation of more cartilage. All these studies have been done over the last few years on umbilical cord stem cells for osteoarthritis show that not only do you get stiffening and pain relief, you often do get some additional cartilage formation. Either when they do a second look by proscopy or they do serial MRIs, like a free, free test look, whatever uh, it is, um, really fine MRI. So the remission rate, so to speak, for osteoarthritis is fantastic. So just say, from grade two it becomes grade, uh, grade four it becomes grade two? Or mm, probably grade one grade is pretty long. It's, it's not usually as dramatic as, as that. But a lot of times you can notice a difference on, on an x-ray taking it you know, the same angle. But on the MRI, it's, it's pretty indicative when they use the high resolution uh, MRI. But it doesn't get worse, right? What is the specialization for this? Uh, is it a mechanical model or what? In the US? What's up? Stem cells? Specialization. What is the degree? What's the Oh well, we have so many doctors that are doing stem cell therapy at our centers. <coughs> Excuse me. It could be anyone from an MD to a DO to a naturopathic doctor. In a lot of states, are able to do these. This would be an of uh, 
stamps and specials. Mm -hmm. Not everyone can do it. They have American Academy of Regeneration. Yeah, if it's in the scope of their practice, they don't necessarily have to get board certified by the American Board of Regenerative Medicine uh, or A4M, but a lot of people do. We have training workshops, for instance, about 12 times a year, where about 70 or 80 providers will come in and we'll teach them the basic science, we'll teach them on real patients how to do the procedures, um, so they get a really good opportunity. Um, and we have people that come back three times a year to do that. If it's within the scope of their practice, they can do it. Like pain, a pain doctor who's doing interventional procedures all day long, you know, it's really not that hard for them to do these orthopedic type injections. Um, but we teach them what biologics to use. A lot of the biologics in the United States are dead. They've been radiated. So they don't even have live stem cells and they're offering a stem cell therapy. So you have a quality control for that? Absolutely. Our so our, our lab is one of the, I think there's only two in the US that have achieved in, uh, investigational new drug status with the FDA. So we're allowed to culture ourselves. So we know exactly how many are in each vial. Five million, 10 million, up to 50 million per vial. And in most labs, they don't even check those cell counts which is not great. I mean, we want to know, because when you look at the clinical trials that have been done over the last 10 years, it's pretty clear how many stem cells work best for certain conditions. And a lot of times it comes down to the, the severity of that disease and the patient's weight is important to know as well. Coming to the last question, uh, if I'm not bothering you, no. uh, what about the affordability in a resource uh, of training country like Pakistan? Is it affordable for the, the rich only or just? It is, and I'm glad you asked that. Because in the United States, the problem is affordability and more, you know, the markup, so to speak. So we've, I think, fixed that problem because we've done over 16,000 procedures worldwide over the last 10 years. We have a high volume. So we've been able to decrease the cost not just of the biologic, but we're able to pass those savings on when we go into, like when we went into Mexico four years ago, and over the last you know, year and a half that we've started working here. So I'll give you an example, okay? If you had um, 50 million stem cells with a procedure done, let's say IV in the United States, you would probably end up paying around 12,000 US dollars for that. In Mexico, we charge um, between four and five thousand, so it's less than half. Here, we charge about thirty-five hundred U.S. dollars, so it's less than eighty percent. It's it's really within the reach of most most folks to um, to have those procedures. Or is it commercially viable for you to decrease the cost? Well. First of all, our, our, our main goal here is to bring these procedures to you know, those people who need them. The bottom line is, it's an outpatient procedure. You know, if it's 50 million stem cells or less, you can come in a couple hours, have the procedure. We'll watch you for at least an hour with the vital signs and everything to make sure everything's stable, and then the, the patient can go home. Happy for the army guys, so I will run the show in Pakistan. I understand. I understand. Thank you. I do anything without that. I understand. No, we have got some one hundred and twenty dollars. We are the military army. We are the military army. Then you should be the candidate for me. You will get an army salary. We are taking the steps and the patients. We have a high level, high level veterinary incident for credit diagnosis by Jazu Hussain. Two very high level veterinary, which was attended by five federal secretaries. And in the order of priority matter, our 32 member committee, I was ninth or eighth in the these are the two things that we need to register. So after that, that will be in a safe, in a controlled and in a full-proof environment 
Right. Like it will go it will not go like a hill cell transplant which is going on in one sphere and one sphere and one sphere. It will not be like that. Right? It will not be like that. It will not be like that. It will not be like that. ऑफ़ and also the more nice focus from the america so it's a very tedious procedure so that is by passing this procedure that will be needed and so the other three hotel is doing that right but in the final we are quite confident to keep an eye on that and very soon we are heading towards working with this now about the regulatory authority with the government and the state authority so our domain is going to be the government right and directly to us Uh, in this Great. Yes, sir. Uh, you are all organ different from brain to kidneys, liver. Can it be used like as an anti-aging uh, medicine? So at 50 years age, I want to regenerate my organs. Can I do this? Yes, absolutely. Um, It's one of the most common reasons people come down to say our Mexico clinic uh, is for anti-aging, and uh, I think one of the second reasons a lot of people come is for autism for, for kids. Um, but with regards to anti-aging, you know, there was a study done back in 2005 at Stanford University. I don't know if you anybody heard. I'm not sure Dr. Aftab has heard. They took two mice and they spliced together their circulation. Has anybody heard of this study? It's called parabiosis. But it was very interesting what happened. They took an old, old mouse and a young mouse, and they spliced together their circulation. And they did a, a, performed a muscle injury to the old mouse. And what they found is that by having it attached to the young mouse, it healed that muscle injury as if it were young. So the question was then, how did that happen? Because when they attached an old mouse to an old mouse, it didn't heal it very well. So that was called the Fountain of Youth experiment. And then what they did was they radio labeled the stem cells in the young mouse to see if the stem cells were the ones performing the healing. And they didn't see any stem cells in the actual muscle healing. So what we've realized is that stem cells help facilitate. The healing, but it's actually the exosomes that are doing most of the work. So that's why we often give exosomes along with the mesenchymal stem cells, and we've seen the benefits go up tremendously. For anti-aging, you know, as we get older, we have chronic inflammation throughout our body. Any muscle, I'm, I'm sorry, any medical condition has chronic inflammation. Okay, so when you give these mesenchymal stem cells and exosomes, where do they go? They go to areas that have inflammation, and they reduce that inflammation. They modulate the immune system. They help prevent cell death, so that you can keep cells in your organs longer. And they have other functions too. So when you look at the studies on anti-aging, the markers of inflammation go way down. The immune system that may be attacking some of you goes way down. They've seen the markers of cancer go down. It's been very impressive. People start to feel better. They get more vitality, more energy. They sleep better, and it can help prevent things like secondary complications of diabetes or whatnot. So it's been very exciting to see that, and we have so many people now who, uh, and I'm hoping that it'll catch on here. Do you think it's a uh, little bit of 20, 30 percent placebo effect, placebo effect? Well, if it's a placebo effect, that usually ends after 90 days. So study after study with the placebo effect is what you see. You know, people want to feel better, right? Because they, you know, paid to have the treatment. But after 90 days, usually the placebo effect evens out, and you can actually see results versus no results. So, and that is helping that we now have a lot more of those double-blinded, randomized studies. So yes, there is a placebo effect, but after 90 days, 
So one thing is confusion. How do you just target an order? Because there's lymphatic supply, there's arterial supply, there's venous uh, uh, venous blood supply. So they don't remain in the if you judge inject in the knees, they will go everywhere. Yes and no. So one of the reasons we do the joint injections for a joint problem is that they do stay in the joint for a few weeks, and by that time they've really amped up the repair regeneration process. You're right, anything you inject into a joint, some of it's going to get into the bloodstream and go other places. So what we noticed eight, nine years ago when we were really first getting started is people get a joint injection and they'll come back and they'll say, you injected my right knee and that feels great. Why is it that I can see better? And why is it that it also helped my shoulder pain? Or some people come back and they say it helped the other knee too. And this isn't just for the first 90 days. This is like six, nine, 12 months later. So we're way past the placebo effect. So that's what happens is somebody gets in the bloodstream and it finds other areas of inflammation. And it's the same thing if you give it IV. So it'll initially a lot of it gets caught in the lungs, but it doesn't stay there. 24 to 48 hours, the lung releases them. They start to go to other areas. And we've seen this in animal studies. They've done some radio labeling and some experiments. You have uh, injected some uh, radioactive diet where you can see where they are going and freeze them. I mean, that's been commonly performed in, in some animal studies. And what they've seen, because they wanted to see how long these cells survive and where they go. So, yeah, they go to areas that have inflammation. And even if it's subclinical, right? I mean, plenty of us may have stage three kidney failure and not even know it, you know? So it might go there and help prevent progression, which is great for anti-aging. But that's how it knows where to go, is because of the inflammation. And one of the problems, though, could be for the blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier is gonna prohibit a lot of these stem cells from getting up to the CNS. So that's why we do the intrathecal along with an IV to help with ALS and S. Any case of anaphylaxis? We've seen some minor allergic type reactions, but we never needed to do that. Big. It was just Benadryl or something minor like that. Well, one, as you mentioned, that this therapy is very effective for the autoimmune diseases. So, have you tried any case for the Latin planets, older Latin planets? So we've only done one or two cases for lichen planus, lichen sclerosis. Or lichen planus, or just the dead and lichen sclerosis. Yeah, I mean, there's some good studies. I'm particularly focusing for the oil. Yes, so there's some good studies on that that have shown very positive results. We just don't get a lot of those cases. And maybe it's because to date we haven't been in certain areas of the world, but in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, we just haven't seen many of those today. But I can, I can send you, if you want me to, some of the studies showing very positive results. Up till now, no treatment has been found for particular good treatment for this disease, except steroids. Right. So we are still looking for the treatment. Yeah, this would be a great idea, a great option. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, there's some good studies on on that disorder, and we just haven't got a lot of those patients. And the very regular person, or more COVID 19, any problems? Yes. So there are two issues with COVID. Uh, well, there's a lot of issues with COVID, but the ones that, as far as stem cells go, are stem cells for COVID itself and then stem cells for post COVID. So stem cells for COVID, there's some good studies out of China, which is ironic, because that's where COVID started. Um, and there's a lot more coming out. Uh, so you'll see uh, initial results from clinical trials. But you know, the problem with COVID is predominantly the cytokine storm that causes ARDS in the lungs, and it sort of feeds on itself on that cascade. So what happens with these stem cells, because they're so good at modulating the immune system, they can halt that cytokine storm. So when you see these studies out of China where they compare, they're not huge studies, they might be 20 patients, maybe 15 patients, but they'll take some that they gave the actual stem cells to in high numbers, like 50 or 100 million, and then the others they gave a placebo. The placebo ones passed away for the most part, and the other ones pretty much all survived. 
So it's very promising for those. Um, and you know, the studies in the U.S. right now, if they're actual clinical trials, it takes a while to set them up. It takes a while to conduct them, and it needs significant follow-up. So those will be published, you know, probably well after the vaccine is all done with the curl. I don't know if the U.S. with the best, what's going to be the best to the health care system in the world. So many people are dying of COVID, and in third countries like India, Pakistan, we have a very few more than It's ironic. It's frustrating. It just, for instance, we got plenty of requests to do uh, stem cell therapy in a hospital. What you have to do, though, is you have rigorous paperwork you have to fill out for the FDA, and you have to give them all of your proprietary information how you process the stem cells, every agent that you use so on and so forth. And a lot of labs are just not willing to do that because if it gets leaked out, it lost a lot of their intellectual property. So it's a problem. We only got to do that a few times. Whereas post-COVID, about a third of the patients have chronic lung problems after you know, recovering as much as they can from COVID. This works amazing. Otherwise, a lot of these patients end up with long-term pulmonary fibrosis, and we can avoid that. Like, look at lopathies, like myopathies, like chronic fibrotic conditions, like chronic ischemic conditions, like reduced volumes of the lung and reduced functional capacity. You know, seeing that the uh, part of your uh, uh, answer to the part of your question, in the neurological conditions, we do a lot of functional improvement and also we do significant improvement in neurological deficit, which is very amazing. Because functional improvement can be there. Uh, initially because of placebo, but after 90 days there is no placebo effect. And if somebody can lift the leg and then he can start walking, previously he or she is wheelchair bound or bed bound, so it means a lot of difference. Huh? So the neurological disability can be reduced or it can be modified. So that is the beauty of the treatment. There are many things uh, uh, which are going on, so Dr. David will take that. Can you please summarize the whole procedure for the further clarification that the patient come to your clinic, for example? So, what is the first step? Uh, are you going to inject the three cultured stem cells or you are going to the sample and then the culture it? And, uh, so, the typical process is that we have patients come in to so see Dr. Mosin here um, and he'll evaluate the condition to see if a patient is you know, a candidate. Unfortunately, about 20 to 25 percent of patients are not candidates. Um, you know, the condition might be too far gone, or we just don't have enough, you know, research to, to show. And the last thing we want to do is have a patient go through a procedure when there's a very high chance it's not going to help or mitigate the condition. So, having said that, let's say a patient is a candidate. Then, the, one of the um, key things is to figure out what type of biologic should be used and how much, right? Because we know that stem cell counts matter. Um, we've seen that in clinical trials in our experience, you know, for the last 10 years. So one of the things that I made sure of is that we were getting quality biologics at affordable pricing for patients, wherever we are in the world, that had enough cells to improve the, the diseases. Now, because we have the IND approval from the FDA, we are allowed to culture the cells in our U.S. lab. And that's what we're using now um, here. And we can use them in den denominations of 5, 10, 20, or 50 million. And if we need to use 100 million, we just use 
50 times 2, right? These are very pure MSCs, and they are kept under like the 8th generation. If you go past like the 12th generation, they start to become non-functional. So we make sure that we keep them you know, well below that so you don't have these issues with senescence and uh, mutations or things like that. Um, so yes, we do use culture, or some people call it expanded MSCs, kept to under um, you know, generations so that they're very functional and pure and potent. And they have the surface markers that have been tested to make sure that there are a lot of colony forming units to make sure they're very active. Now, one of the things we also do frequently is we add exosomes along with the MSCs for these procedures. Because, let me put this down for a second. Um, what we found is that exosomes work very quickly and you can get like a quick effect for months, but it's almost like this. The umbilical cord stem cells act a little bit slower, but they work a longer period of time. So when we get exosomes plus the MSCs, it's a one-two punch, so to speak, for patients. And we found that that helps tremendously for almost every condition. Not really for arthritis. Arthritis, we just stick with the MSCs. But for you know some of these serious issues, diabetes, COPD, MS, ALS, post-stroke. Any expiry period, please? Any what? Expiry period. Oh, expiration? No expiry period. Is it going to expire? Is it, is it going to uh, wear expire. off? Yeah. The, the biologics or the treatment? Uh, the stem cells. The stem cells, okay. Or the light. Okay, very good question. So, um, in, at our lab, once they're processed, we prior preserve them very carefully. And that we only lose about 5% of the viability of those cells. So it's about 90, 95%. Very high viability when they get thawed out. We bring them here on dry ice, which is negative 80 degrees Celsius, so keeps them cryopreserved. We have a cryogenic freezer here with a generator backup, okay? So those can be kept for up to five years. Like the blood products, they are mostly for one month. Yeah, we have to get this years, years of viability on the, on the, uh, in the cryogenic freezer. Now, exosomes are different. You can keep them in a regular refrigerator freezer for up to a year. So they're a lot easier to transport. Well, I assume that it's in the foreign body, right? And you're going to inject it. So is there any uh, you for example, the immunosuppressant or something? So you don't need to. All the studies looking at uh, cross matching and all that stuff, you just don't need to do that. Oh, so you do that. You don't need to do it. Yeah, nobody rejects the material. None of these biologics have HLA2 markers, which is what causes the immune response, right? So they don't cause that. Yeah. No. Yes, ma'am. Many of these procedures with statins, do Pakistan? Where we do them now. <coughs> Here in Islamabad, yes. With Dr. Mohsen and our other uh, team members. We do so them. you're also working in other cities? We, we will be. We're not open yet in Lahore, and Karachi, and Festival. Um, in but India, we're not in India. Um, we have a lab and we're at a clinic opening up in the Philippines, but they, they're on COVID lockdown big time. Um, we have uh, clinics in Mexico, Honduras, um, and some other, some Germany, Japan. Not yet. London will, will be working. Why don't you can? Well, you know, a lot of this stuff has been really slowed down with COVID. I mean, London's been, I mean, the UK has been in total lockdown for a while now. And it just has registered the consign of any new in the six months ago. Second, we do the consign consultation with the central office of food. They have noted that we can't even open the moment of the UK. Uh, it's only looking after the public sector, NHS, and NHS is very, very poor. Mm -hmm. They want to buy the for the other company, I cannot say that that is from the other mm -hmm. So it is something like hyperbolic oxygen, like something like the skin graphing, something like the nose, and something like that can go in the private sector. But maybe that in this kind of year, it is last for the European public connections. So probably uh, in Glasgow, uh, there will be a problem. And in London, there will be a problem. 
So we are making a legion with them in the looking after that. Mr. the issue of variety on this case needs to be taken into confidence because the administration process, as here is that of the quota and the draft, is not governed by the issue of variety in the So everything which goes through the issue of variety in this case, and then there will be the center registration and then the therapy registration and the therapy registration and everything. So the UK is lagging behind. Similarly, other European countries are lagging behind. But in Malaysia, they are doing very well. Uh, they are doing very well in farms, countries like China and blah blah. South Korea, you know, there is also teaching and training the uh, procession in South Korea, which I just because of COVID. You know. So they are doing a lot um, in countries like South Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, other countries where the legislations are a bit fast. In the UK, they come here, but they will not take a little while once the central leaders will penetrate. And how much is your Penetration in the U.S. in present every state. Not every state. Uh, we have 40 centers. Um, I would say about 30 of those are in California. Um, our company is in Arizona, so we have several centers in Arizona. We have, you know, both coasts: New York, Florida, Virginia. Um, as far as the middle Midwest, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, yes, we have one in Boston. Um, as far as the Midwest, they're a little bit later to, to sort of come to the party, so to speak. So we have some centers in Oklahoma. Um, uh, well, Nashville's not really in the Midwest. Uh, we have some in uh, Iowa, uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, so who is the CEO of this? Oh. Yeah. Who's running this group? Oh, that would be me. That would be me. Dr. Green has worked with some uh, cultural centers in various uh, areas like Taiwan, London. There's a manufacturer uh, of these stem cells there. So we are not here manufacturing, we are exporting them. We are bringing the first and final finished one, cryo, reserving them at minus 85 centigrade, and uh, then we will be uh, uh, dispensing them. Are you planning to? The stem cells are from the birth tissues, you know, and then it's a very tedious procedure because you will be having the MOU sign for the people to get their consent to give the placenta donation as unlikely for the donation. And then our antenatal care is not and, and our antenatal care is not that strong. Our repeated pregnancies, because of repeated pregnancies, you know, the quality of the stem cells is not that great because we are not looking up to um, uh, the uh, Mothers from the day one of the antenatal care. We are not giving them good proteins, we are not giving them good zinc, we are not giving them good nutrients. So, by the end of the day, you know, the stem cells that people will have here, they will be not of that quality. And then it is not cost effective at the moment. There are a few centers in Pakistan, one is the care and research lab, they are doing the cultures. But at the same time, they don't know, they have got no idea that where they can give. So, they have got no therapeutic study. But there are certain research labs which can do culture and we can do culture as well if we have got plenty, plenty, plenty forms available. Mm -hmm. But it is just that it is the very new birth of this alone and we are just at the very beginning. So uh, maybe down the road after five years, 
uh, once we have got free funding and people need to accommodate that idea that they can be donating things and they can be But they should be banks for And banks, yeah, for yeah. 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 This kind of banks will be established by the government, you know, because uh, it's a very the centralized big enterprise system. It's a very big uh, system, you know. And, uh, that's the most of that, right? So, in order to do culture and do better labs, for instance, in Irvine, California, we need to have clean rooms, you have to have ISO 5 certification, CGMP compliance. And there's a lot that goes into it. You want to have less than like 20 particles per million in order to ensure that your cells are going to be the highest quality. In addition, instead of using flasks in order to culture cells, which has great limited big time, you know, you can't get to the numbers. You have to have a bioreactor, and bioreactors are really, really, really expensive. So, are you GCI certified? Are we what? GCI certified? Uh, no, I don't think that exists in the U.S. I think, uh, no, GCI, the certified international is not about the GCI certified. The farm hospital is GCI certified. Yeah, most labs in the, in the U.S. they get AATB certification, American mm -hmm. Association of Tissue Banks, which ours is. We're ISO five. International, you know, and then uh, CGMP, current good manufacturing practices, uh, compliant. So we have that, but I don't, I don't think they do. Different countries, they have got their own. Do you have a presence in the Middle East also? The way? So we're in the process, process of working on some relationships. I have a friend there who is a periodic surgeon, head of periodic surgeon, deep dent clinic. Ooh, nice. Uh, Dr. Javid is up. Okay. Yeah, so, be okay. so one of the uh, things Dr. Mosin said is about prenatal care. So prenatal care, if it's not great, has a direct correlation with the quality of the tissue that you can obtain. So at our lab in Mexico, Mexico City, when they started the process, they just got the donor program up and running, but they got the tissue from the first dozen like placentas and umbilical cords. They had to discard 11 of them because the cell counts were terrible. So what they ended up doing was going further with these OB clinics and providing free prenatal vitamins, nutrition, they went the extra mile. And when, then when they started getting the umbilical uh, cords and placentas, they were able to keep 11 out of 12 instead of discarding 11 out of 12. So it makes a huge difference in the quality of the tissue is the quality of the prenatal care. So in future, this is of a uh, I mean, uh, artificial intelligence just manufacturing these stem cells, not human, some uh, what you call uh, laboratory, laboratory. I mean, I think that'll, that'll come down the pipe eventually, absolutely. Artificial intelligence is going to take over the world. One of my teachers, you know, uh, 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 who can make them uh, and use the stem cell. And that is a Japanese guy, his name was Nikola, he was a bit painted, and I can him. So, in use of stem cells, we have more body cells, we have the cells, and we have the cells. What he did in three nights, multiple generation, which is a very, very frustrating operation. The retired junctions of the cells of the retinal layer, they don't let them do anything. Because the key, the, the key is with the God. We can't unlock it here. But still, you know that guy, he was in the red place. And when people they did their PhDs, because they get in each of new tissues. And this is the time that we will go for the new organs. Our time will come that we will grow um, kidneys and livers and then we will be transplanting them and we will back to the It is just like you want insulin, you know, that you make outside the body. And then you administer it to the body. So it's the same genetics, it's the same amino acids, it's just it absolutely the but same. It can be genetically engineered. Yeah. Genetically engineered. Yeah. So the time would arrive that by, uh, in the set of cells, we'll be talking about the tissues and we'll be talking about the organs and then the organ donation, organ transplantation. Okay. What about the religious issues? Well, there are no religious issues about okay. it. The stem cells. Yeah, I can address that. Issues. If you are giving the form, you can't do this. You are in laws, you should target in the GPs as well. So GPs are the community leaders. In the state, 80,000 people are recruited to run the catamaran transfer program. They are the federal government, all the other provincial government, they have got very, very limited funds. 
how we can reduce people in health and security government to do government or human type of care, very soon we will talk about plans and different programs of plans that we are doing in the time we are either set plans that do a lot of plans like kidney and time we are like kidney and liver things like that and predictably the idle set was done and frankly I did plans that you know we get a very time we are doing plans that we are doing in the time we are doing in the time so these are the areas which the government needs to look after uh, because they have got huge findings and then uh, we need a lot of legislations. But you know, the Sharia court has said in 2008 that it is not an Islamic. So the petition was, uh, you know, to say that uh, they dismissed the petition in 2008. Uh, uh, the the was taken by people that it is an Islamic. So they just dismissed that. So it means that it is a So that was, and since then we are doing a lot of work on the interest. And the only thing that we have short of funds, and I want to make it foolproof, cost effective in the road environment. This is my bit with the government that I would like to let it run by somebody like here, you or if, Nana, and if, Nana, just because of the power of the army. No, it should be under federal government. In one or two institutions where we can make the news and notes and buy one and drive to a drive so that nothing goes in media. But then you should be the master trader. You should be the yeah, master trader. Yeah, we have started a diploma in Calamari Plus and the University of Law Sciences, where I am one of their professors at Germany. So we have started the diploma, we are teaching telling people about Calamari Plus. And it is a huge program for your know, education, for your know, education, for your know, education, for your know, education, for your know, education. Like an assault program in the world. So, so it is not just like, the, like that you have to do one sporadic transplant and then it will be. You have to make a united network of organ sharing and in that network, in the patients, in the public, in the public, in the legislators. Um, and uh, uh, so for that, you need a very huge funding which the federal government has declined to. I asked them for a very huge funding. I asked them for a limited funding. Again, they declined. So, so every part, Sun Institute also has a great work. Sun Institute. We have nothing to do with this. We are the and we are, uh, we seek our, uh, we take our cases directly to the Parliament, the Standing Committee of the Health. And uh, the Federal Minister happens to be the chairman of our monetary group. And uh, we have our group cycling help as we uh, uh, sit together, so we can sit together and then secondly to be present there, so we can help. The only thing is that we don't have that much, uh, that much money to proceed with. But at the time, all right, that if we start that, so we can then see at least in the current time, then we can work a little bit. Have you worn the media? What do you guys in here do? Once we will bring, once they will give us uh, uh, the money, and once we will chop out the program, then we will go to the media. Uh, and in these states, would it help? Uh, for someone who has been amputated, for instance, fingers or thumb or anything like that, yeah, at a later stage of, of what condition? Um, in case of amputations. Oh, oh amputations? Um, no, it's not going to help regenerate any of the lost tissue. Um, certainly, in the liver, we would regenerate nicely the liver. But unfortunately, the types of stem cells we're using don't turn us into a salamander type situation. Where you can regrow the land. In that time, the water has given this ability to support the land. So the idea of the is there. Even if you know the many trees, they have got many shoot and many big distances in their roots and in their shoot. You can see that some trees are 1,000 years old, some are 2,000 years old, some are 3,000 years old, but they are as green as in the roots. So their body stems as. Uh, in their roots and in their shoots as well. So this is an idea which the God has already given um, uh, in, in many areas. Yeah. So we have to unlock the cells uh, in our body so we have to induce them uh, and to work as the stem cells and to grow the organs and tissues in the laboratory and then to uh, transplant as an artificial thing. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I turn it back over. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Uh, I'm a former police officer. I'm a striker by Dr. David Green. 
and Dr. Hossein. I wish it to help as many uh, patients in Pakistan to achieve a better quality of life. Now I would like to introduce you to the founder and the chief operating officer of R3 stem cell therapy in Pakistan. Actually, he's the one who has introduced this therapy in Pakistan. So I would like to call Sir Omar Farah and Jindu. First-hand experience, I came across a lot of patients who hear these tremendous stories on what stem cell therapy can do for them and how it has changed their lives. So it's an honor to uh, be here once again, and Professor Wilson and for carrying this forward, and we look forward to working with all of you and uh, making a difference in you know, this country. Thank you so much, and please make your way to the question message, and uh, any questions you can read and you can talk to me one by one. Thank you.